everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Randy Hartman. I'm your Zone 4 Commissioner, and this is going to be um, our town hall meeting for tonight. We have the agendas up on the board for you to follow through. Um, the, and kind of the purpose of this was several years ago, we had a, a strategic planning session. And one of the things that, that we looked at and agreed to is that um, we need to have some more connectivity to communities, especially the smaller communities. So we came up with the idea of doing zone meetings or town hall meetings for each zone. It started about two, three years ago. Um, we got through the first year okay, and then COVID hit. But I'm here to tell you that I have, this is my third one in six years, so I'm ahead of everybody else. <laughs> now, but the key to that is, I beat Jason in picking a date, and the other three were just elected last election cycle, so they haven't had a turn yet. So, so that's the only reason I'm ahead of everybody else. But we want to thank you for coming tonight. Um, this is a small community meeting. Uh, wh what we wanted to do is follow up with some of the projects that we already had going on, it, you know, taking place, where we are today with them and how they're doing, answer some of those questions that we keep, I keep getting uh, frequent emails about, um, traffic, stormwater, those kind of things. And then we'll, we'll go on with some of the other things. Um, we have a great s staff here tonight. Um, I'll introduce uh, Khaled Reshadot, our city manager's here. Uh, Ron Niebert, our assistant city manager's here. Uh, I have Mayor Fred Cleveland's in the back. I saw Lisa Martin here, and Jason just walked in. So we pretty much have everybody here. I don't s didn't see Valley walk in. So we're here, um, if we're, if I'm a little reluctant to ask questions, it's uh, something that uh, Florida calls sunshine, and we can't talk amongst you know ourselves unless it's at a public announced meeting and there are minutes taken. So you won't see the four of us engage in any conversation together. Um, but the rest, I have Kyle Flagley's here with the um, city, our city engineer. Rob Salazar's here is our leisure service director. Uh, Shane Corbin, <laughs> and I apologize for that but he's only been here for three weeks. <laughs> so, so he's our, our newest guy on town, in town, and um, yes. He is the Director of Developmental Services, which means he's over engineering, planning, and the building department. So he has a big role to fill. Um, we're certainly glad to have him. Um, and, and then at the very end, we have uh, our chief, who has had an amazing, busy last week, if you can imagine. So I want to publicly thank him and all of his staff for, and those who uh, assisted us in everything that they did. We had a pretty safe week. Um, we certainly didn't have some of the problems that we had last year or some of the problems that we had in other areas of Florida. So I want to thank him and his staff for all the hard work that they did. So we certainly do appreciate it. You can see on the agenda, which I can't see, um, we're going to go over a few items. And the first item is, is uh, we're going to talk about stormwater in the Corbin Park in the west side area. And you're going, well, why are we talking about that? They're not in zone four. Well, they used to be in zone four until we rezoned everything last year. So these were projects that were near to dear to me, um, kind of started those two, two or three years ago. And I just wanted to give everybody an update about where we are. Half of Corbin Park is mine, but all of the historic west side is now in valley zone and zone one. So that's why we're going to kind of follow up with that. And then there's some other, the other rest of the items were issues that we've all kind of talked about, beat around the bush, had lots of questions. So we'll get a little further explanation. At the very end, we'll have questions. Um, I would ask you that if you have a question, if you'll queue up in front of the podium and talk to the mic. Uh, we are being videoed and audioed for a, a publication at a later time. We're not live stream. Um, in the back of the room, we have a series of maps. Um, we have a flood map that includes Venetian Bay. So, yes. So, uh, it was, when we had our, our flood mitigation meeting a couple months ago, that map kind of got left out. So, apologize for that, but we brought it here tonight. So, if you live in the Venetian Bay neighborhood and you had significant flooding or flooding inside the, your living area, please take a minute to walk back to the flood map. There's a pin back there. Put a little dot, you know, in or around where your house is so that we can have that record as part of our ongoing process of studying it and something that's going to be presented to you later, probably in April or May, I think, is when that report is due back, at least to us. So we'll have another uh, community meeting on that uh, citywide on what that 
results were back. Um, we had issues with um, during the storm debris pickup. You know, why were you picking up on the street next door but not my street? It, you know, it has to be a city street, not a county street. And, and then I've had some people say, well, you pick up my trash, so I must be in the city. No, that's something that, that we voluntarily took last April. Um, we're doing trash pickup throughout the in, in, inclusive uh, ISB area. So we're doing all of the waste disposal service for everybody. Even though you're not a city resident, we're still doing the trash collection for you. So if you, you know, there were some people said, well, just because you're picking up my trash, I must be in the city. You must have annexed me. And that's not necessarily the case. So please take a look at the map and see if you're on the map. And with that, I'm going to start off with uh, Kyle Fegley. He's going to get a, the thing show, started, and we'll hear a little bit about stormwater and the flooding. So thank you, Kyle. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Hartman. It's good to be here. Um, as mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, three very important uh, current stormwater improvement projects that impact and, and will benefit uh, your area of the city. The first project is the historic West Side Drainage Improvement Project. And before I forget, um, <clears throat> one item regarding this project is we have just uh, set a, a update published subdivision, okay? So we've done some retrofit projects in here. Um, you may recall the Mary Avenue streetscape project, uh, Washington streetscape project, um, you know, our maintenance ops crews, we retrofit, rec you know, dilapidated um, inf you know, infrastructure, but we haven't really done an overview, you know, a comprehensive view of this entire area. So that's, that's what we plan to do with this particular project. Okay, just to um, uh, briefly review the, the project timeline, um, th this project, uh, as, long with, uh, as well as Corbin Park, they all started well before the natural disasters we, we realized late last year. Um, so the, um, the initial field services, the initial uh, geotechnical evaluation, um, all the, the topographic information, um, all the LIDAR, everything that's needed, an environmental assessment is very important, has already been accomplished, okay? So uh, again, we're, we're at the 60% design uh, stage. Staff's reviewed it, and we're ready to present that to the public on April 6th. So we are currently in the, um, the permitting phase in, in April. Um, we have had a pre-application meeting with the Water Management District, and, and so far the, look, the design looks like it's compatible with their guidelines. So we hope to finalize, once we get their input, finalize the design um, in, in mid-summer and then put it out to bid. Some of the specific areas um, that um, we are aware of um, and have had um, specific input from the community include, include the uh, Rose um, Apartments off Robert Street that uh, is kind of like a repetitive flooding area. Um, also, if you're familiar with Milford Place, uh, I think it's right there by the, the uh, Boys and Girls Club, the old fire station, Canal Street to Enterprise. Dust Street, we've had some issues. Uh, Myrtle Avenue has um, it has some inlet structures, but they're old, uh, antiquated, and they're all uh, undersized. And we're going to do some other miscellaneous improvements, some, some curbing work and that type of thing. So this just gives a, you know, a brief idea of what we're going to do. Like I said, upsize the existing storm pipes. Um, you know, a lot of this infrastructure has been in place for 50 years or more. And it, it may have worked when the area was, uh, you know, 50%, 60% developed. There's just more runoff um, uh, at this stage because there's a lot of infill throughout the city and you know, specifically in, in both the Corbin area and the historic west side. There's a lot of infill. So a lot of the pipes are, uh, you know, they don't have the proper slope. They don't have the hydraulic capacity. Uh, they don't have the smoothness in the pipe. So all that's going to be upgraded. Um, obviously, we're going to extend pipe infrastructure to areas that are low-lying and capture that runoff, and hope, hopefully that will recover. Um, and then um, put some backflow prevention devices on there. Um, all these areas 
um, as is much the city, it's all tidally influenced. So it either discharges to the river, uh, Turnbull Bay, um, you know, goes to Spruce Creek, goes to Rose Bay, and then goes to the river. So it's all uh, tidally influenced. And of course, water quality. Uh, today's standards, uh, whether it be uh, you know, DEP, Corps, uh, St. John's, um, you, you can't just discharge water into the downstream water body. You have to uh, remove um, pollutants, you know, whether it be you know, sheen from water, I mean from oil uh, floating on top of the water, particulates or whatever it is. You just have to pre-treat it before you discharge now. So it's another one of the challenges we have. Okay, this is just a broad uh, picture of the uh, current um, progress of the project, the project schedule. Those items in green are, are complete, and um, the uh, yellow or orange items are the ones that uh, are remaining um, to achieve a, a you know, full, complete set of documents to go out to bid. And then um, hopefully we'll move forward with this the latter part of this year. Um, we do have some uh, grant funding to assist with this particular project, and uh, we'll reapply for a um, uh, cost share um, grant with the Water Management District as well. And all these improvements are uh, essentially being supported by either ARPA or the stormwater utility fee, uh, which you pay annually, so there's no assessment at all associated with, it, with any of these improvements. All right. Move to the Corbin Park area, and uh, very similar um, to the historic west side. Again, this is a, an existing um, subdivision, so it, it, it has a lot of constraints when you're working with an existing right of way. The houses are at certain finished floor elevations. You can't change those things. So, how do you draw down the water uh, quickly when you know downstream is the Turnbull Creek, Turnbull Canal, and it surges up four feet? So, um, you know, th there are definitely a lot of challenges associated with this particular neighborhood. This area, uh, just to give you an idea, is, is also uh, bounded by 44, 44 to the north, uh, the Turnbull Creek to the, to the east, and goes down to the, um, the south parts down by like Magnolia Street, uh, right where Doster comes out and then heads north to Hidden Pines Boulevard and ties into that canal, which goes under 44, kind of by that furniture store. So that's the area in general that we're, we're looking at to facilitate with these improvements. Similar schedule, similar scope, similar improvements to the historic west side. This project is just slightly behind uh, the historic west side project. It's just the way the design and the survey crews fell. So um, we expect to receive the 60% plans this month. So um, staff will then review it, uh, make some revisions, changes, um, suggestions, and then once we um, get to a level we feel comfortable, then we will have a public meeting for the Corbin Park area residents to go over the proposed improvements. This just spells out some of the um, specific areas. Again, some of the input we've received from the community we did have a, a community meeting in the beginning of the project, so these are some of the areas that we are going to uh, focus on and make some of the improvements with uh, input, of course, at the 6% uh, public hearing. Same type of scope of work. Um, you know, we realize there's a lot of county right-of-ways in this area, but there's also a lot of areas that don't have uh, drainage structures. They don't have curbing. They have no way to convey the runoff, so um, based on all the information we have, uh, we're going to just make sure that there's a positive outfall so that uh, essentially this project and the historic west side will help the area recover during a flood during a typical rain event. Um, I don't think anyone can account for 21 inches of rain, but this is for a typical rain event that we receive on a, uh, like a summer afternoon. And again, this is the, the project schedule. Um, it is probably just, like I said, mentioned, a little bit behind uh, Historic West Side. So uh, it's probably fall before this project will be out to bid. And um, similar um, funding sources as well. So uh, there, there won't be any assessments or costs to the residents. Um, just be a whole lot of construction and disturbance. So 
bear with us during construction. Okay, the third item I'd like to talk about, we initially had the meeting back in January uh, right in this uh, very uh, center, is the exposure analysis. Um, and this is, is a result of Hurricane Ian uh, more so, but Hurricane Ian and Nicole. So um, th this uh, analysis is going to take a look at um, a variety of items. Um, it's it's going to take a look at the existing infrastructure uh, to see uh, if it's sufficient. Uh, are there maintenance requirements? They're also going to look at our land development regulations uh, involving uh, big track developments. And uh, they're actually going to model the entire watershed. So when, when they model it, uh, it'll be a two-dimensional model. Uh, I believe TrueFlow is the software they're going to use. They're going to model the, the entire area as it is today. And then we're going to also take off some of these larger developments that have occurred recently, uh, so, such as your coastal woods, um, your Venetian Bay, your Promenade Park. And we're going to see uh, how that impacts uh, downstream the existing developments and see if there's any impact at all. So that's really the um, objective of this whole analysis as, as far as modeling-wise. One item that has come out of this is the, the City Commission has actually enacted a moratorium at this point in time uh, for any future development on residential properties, 10 acres or greater, that are uh, located uh, in a special flood hazard area uh, deemed by FEMA. So the special flood hazard areas are typically those flood zones that are uh, designated as A zones or A E zones. So that's in effect until June 27th until the study is done, we get the results, and, and then we, get, uh, we can take the initiative to take whatever action is needed. So um, some of the uh, reference to the Senate bills and the House bills, uh, these are all uh, floodplain related and uh, sea level resiliency um, criteria. Uh, these programs are, um, these were enacted by the state so, and they're done annually. Uh, the state has to provide a program every year to the governor's office. And if you follow those guidelines in those particular bills, uh, you're eligible for resiliency grant. As a matter of fact, um, we actually had two grants. Uh, there's only one shown on here. Uh, we did get $250,000 for a study. We've actually got some additional money for another project within the city. So uh, it, it does pay to submit for grants. They, they do actually award those. <laughs> I think this is just a synopsis of what I've, I've already talked about. It is citywide. Um, I know there was a lot of focus because there was a lot of flooding in, in the core of the city. Um, but there, we also are going to look at um, you know, beachside in, in the entire city with this particular study. Um, as I talked about, some of the new larger developments uh, associated with the stormwater management system, were there potential, were, were, there, were there adversarial uh, type effects downstream? We'll look at that. Um, Looking at the stormwater code, we've actually already sent that. We've got some feedback from them, preliminary feedback. So they have looked at our land development regulations. And um, once it's all said and done, they're going to present their findings to the city commission. And the, the, you know, the final presentation is going to be in May. And at that point in time, the commission is going to review, uh, amend if necessary, and adopt these, uh, this particular plan. And what we really need to do is make an action plan. So what what is the usefulness of this, of this whole analysis? Well, w once we get a plan, an action plan, we'll then establish short-term and long-term goals of how we, we can abate or minimize our exposure to similar, you know, similar type natural disasters. This particular phase of the analysis is, is complete. Um, again, this was back in January and February. So uh, this is just their data collection uh, process uh, that they did. They uh, have looked at some of the existing uh, infrastructure along, uh, you know, 44 in this area. Um, we've given them um, any record drawings we have had as built, LIDAR data, uh, survey information. So they do a lot of research and plug in real values for vertical control. You know, these, these are real NAVD values, so you know how, how high the water raises. They're not, it's just not relative information. Um, I talked about it. it is universal. It is mainland and beachside. 
and the commission will get the presentation as well as the action plan at a later date in May. Okay, this again indicates the data collection. Um, the consultant is, is complete. Um, they are still reviewing our, our stormwater LDR codes to see if they uh, need to be uh, tweaked a little bit. Um, they are in the process of, um, we haven't seen the 2D model, but they apparently have uh, completed their modeling to date. Um, and also, uh, this takes into account, uh, again, I already mentioned previously, everything's tidally influenced. Um, during uh, Ian, uh, we had uh, about four foot surge um, in the Turnbull Creek area. So it was Turnbull Bay it's in its entirety. And it, it didn't recede for an extended period of time. So the water, um, um, you know, stayed around for two or three days after the after the storm event. Okay, and this just summarizes again. This is the time frame. So um, end of April, um, all the complete development analysis will be done, um, and this will be at a uh, city commission meeting. It'll be presented. So just you know, watch our website. Um, it'll be posted uh, for. Um, on our website um, and they'll develop an action plan so with that that summarizes the uh, the three uh, particular stormwater flood improvement projects we have going on in this area I appreciate your time I'll take um, any questions after everyone's done with that we have do you want to introduce the next speaker sure, sure. okay thank you Kyle <laughs> so our, our next feature speaker is uh, our police chief Eric Feldman Okay, thanks, Commissioner. Hi, everybody. So I'll talk about a couple of topics, and I realize that these aren't necessarily specific to Zone 4, Commissioner Hartman's zone. However, I think you will be interested in these in more of a citywide approach. You need me to, okay. Better? Okay. So again, I'm gonna cover a couple things that I know affect us all as residents of New Smyrna Beach. They won't necessarily just be in Commissioner Hartman's zone, but I think uh, you know, we'll probably answer some questions in terms of what your police department and your city is doing for you to address uh, issues that we all as residents deal with every day. So the first one is traffic calming projects. Uh, as everybody knows, we have a bit of a traffic and parking issue in New Smyrna Beach. So, it is, it is one that myself and the city staff uh, usually uh, have discussions on in a variety of different ways on a daily basis. Uh, we recognize that we are a destination town. That was obvious during spring break, and it's obvious every weekend in the summer for all of us who live here. Uh, and we know that we can always do better, so let me start with that. You know, one thing I appreciate the most about this city is the support we get as a police department from all of you. And that goes without saying. That's, uh, I think Florida is the holdout for support of law enforcement, so thank you for that. But we do hold ourselves accountable and we know we can do better. And when it comes to traffic and parking, the first thing I want to talk about is the how do you address issues in your neighborhood. So the city adopted a traffic calming handbook in 2021. So if you are dealing with an issue that is ongoing and you live on a city of New Smyrna street maintained by the city of New Smyrna, you are eligible to go through the process that's outlined in this handbook. You can go on the city website if you haven't heard of it before it's under transportation and you can pull it up and look at it and review the application process so this could be a speed issue is usually the most common one that i hear but it could be a variety of different things um, the guidelines i think i wrote them on there but i can't even see my own slide so the, uh, the biggest one is if you're going to complete this application you're looking for 75 percent participation from not your neighborhood, but necessarily the street that is impacted. So if you live on a street, and let's say that you want to reduce traffic flow or you want to reduce the speed of the traffic. Um, and we've verified, and this is really a program that is owned and shared. Oh, thanks, man, appreciate it. Nah, I'm clearly not a millennial. I brought a millennial, he's in the back of the room, this is deputy chief. Yeah. <laughs> well, I gotta go back one. Okay. 
So the, uh, the traffic calming program handbook, I said, can be found under transportation. In it, you'll see the application. So let's say that your street is in between two stop signs. You're having a major issue with traffic on your street. Go on and look at that application. What you'll need to do is get 75% of your neighbors to buy into the fact that you feel like there's a problem. They will sign along with their address showing that they're a resident of that street. It'll come to the city engineer who is sitting here. He'll take a look at it and make sure it meets the requirements of the uh, traffic calming program. And then it will likely come back over to the police department for review. And what we're gonna look at is, are there passive things that we can do to reduce the problem? And of course, you all know, we have traffic enforcement. So we do have motor officers that ride motorcycles. We have traffic officers that drive on unmarked cars. And uh, we do, I think, a pretty good job of enforcing traffic. It's honestly gotten better and better over the last couple of months as we start growing some of our specialty units thanks to kind of an increase in our staffing and people wanting to work and live here with us. Um, so that'll be kind of the first thing we look at. And by passive, it can be a variety of different things. It can be our motors units coming and hiding in your driveway and getting people to slow down through a variety of enforcement measures. It can be uh, feedback speed limit signs showing you what your speed is, you know, coming through, and it can go all the way to, you know, even a new stop sign or a new, you know, speed limit sign. The speed limit is 35 miles an hour. Um, anyway, we'll take a look at that. We will come up with a plan and we'll try that out and see if that works. And if it doesn't, and it clearly needs to be a measure beyond the capability of the police department, we'll defer that back to city staff. It'll go back to Kyle and then through a process that's outlined in that program handbook that you're welcome to read. Parking, another small issue. So what are we doing about parking? Um, we don't have enough parking. So it's a difficult, uh, it, it's, a, it's a more complex problem, right, for the police department. We're your enforcement arm, right? It's our job to enforce parking and to you know, improve behavior by those who are coming to visit our city. And we know we have a bit of a problem with parking behavior. You know, and I'll give you an example. You know, regularly we see on Beachside as the beach closes and pushes that traffic up off those ramps, whether it's high tide or capacity, we all know it just gets congested as a mess, uh, whether it's North Beach or South Atlantic. Uh, we're well aware. Um, you know, it's kind of a bit of a problem for the police department because if we move them, they just do small little circles waiting for the beach to reopen so we can't get rid of them. Uh, we can't implement the one suggestion I got during spring break, which was we lift both bridges and don't let anybody beachside. That's not an option. So, uh, but there are ways to notify those who are coming into our town, wanting to visit our beaches, that the beaches are at capacity. And we'll continue to work with city staff to try to figure out how to message that to those that maybe want to go to a different beach before they get off, you know, on 44 or come down uh, Highway 1. Uh, some of the things, though, that your police department is doing in terms of parking, we do manage the parking enforcement staff, right? Nobody likes those poor people who do that job. So. Please give them a smile and a, and a wave when you see them. It's a, it's a terrible job in the middle of the summer. Nobody likes getting a parking ticket. But they do a very good job of not only enforcing parking, but identifying things that a city can do in terms of staff to improve parking. The city has commissioned a parking task force. They're going to be meeting and developing ideas for the commission to vote on, and that will, of course, come to the police department in terms of enforcement. But I can tell you a couple of things that we're doing proactively to try to improve some of the beachside stuff is getting in front of it by adding additional folks to enforce parking. So we have about nine parking enforcement specialists. About most of those are part-time. We're creating a third full-time position. But then we're also taking, have you guys seen the community service aid cars, kind of the smaller car, the guys with the tan polo shirt? It doesn't have blue and red lights. It has yellow lights on top. We're going to be expanding that program. So those are our community service aids very friendly folks, typically folks who either were in law enforcement previously or they're interested in going into law enforcement. So it's their way to join the police department, have a job, and kind of get out there and, and relate back and forth to the public. So up to now, they've taken property reports, they help direct traffic and, and do other things so that we can keep police officers free to come handle calls for requests. We're working ordinance, which will immediately change behavior because when we start rolling in elite towing to Beachside, uh, that will immediately clean up the Sapphire parking lot and those who want to park on Lakewood and so forth. But that's not all of it. Uh, we also recognize that people love to come around and get back in line and just sit and block roadways waiting for the beach to open. We're well aware of that. So we're coming up with a better strategy to address that. That is illegal. You can't do that. But we have to come up with a way to educate, right? So 
we're going to be working with city staff to post more signage down there saying, no, you cannot just sit in a roadway and wait for the beach to open. And then we'll enforce that with police officers to get them to continue to move around. We know that likely means they're going to drive in a circle on North Beach, right, which is going to infuriate those of you that live in North Beach even more, if there's anybody here. Um, we recognize that. You know, we'll do our best if, you know, they have law enforcement highly visible and present telling them that they can't, you know, just sit in a particular spot. Perhaps they'll want to try the beach down on 27th or Canaveral or, or farther down. So uh, those are some of the things that we're doing internally as a police department just to address it as much as we can. I do believe a lot of it is just behavior. If I go drive up by the Sapphire Park line, it's clear they don't care. They don't think that uh, obviously the enforcement is going to um, be enough to, uh, to change that behavior, so we're gonna work on changing that for them. Um, all, right. all right, another hot topic, trains blocking intersections. Anybody ever caught behind the train? Anybody not ever caught behind the train? I was caught today, I could not get around. Um, it is a major issue for the city. Uh, it's not fair. Past, there have been some improvements. That's why 10th Street was widened. That's why we have the, the, uh, the ramp over on uh, 44. Those are all things commissioned through the Federal Railway Association. So we are restarting those talks now to say, okay, what's next? What do we need to do now? Um, FEC has agreed to meet with myself and the city manager and whoever uh, Colin wants to have there to at least have a conversation. So their senior vice president will be coming to, uh, to talk with us so that we can at least express to him, this doesn't work. It doesn't work for our citizens. It doesn't work for our emergency services. It's not appropriate. Um, we've looked at things like passing an ordinance to start citing the trains. Uh, it's not outside the realm of possibility but uh, it is something that has not necessarily been effective in other cities. So we're really benchmarking ourselves to see, you know, what uh, the proper way forward will be. Okay. And I think we're going to do questions at the end, right? Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time. Thank you. So our next speaker is going to be Rob Salazar. He's our Leisure Services Director. Thank you, Commissioner Hartman. Uh, first topic for us in leisure. We've got our Page Park Pickleball Courts. So this fiscal year, the commission granted the department $500,000 to work towards building pickleball courts um, off Page Park, adjacent to Page Park off Glencoe Road. Um, the city has been working with um, a design firm, engineering firm, for the last four months trying to get an engineering scope rendered that would meet the needs of the city and what the citizens want. Um, but unfortunately, the designs have come back significantly over the budget of what we have been looking for. So we are reconvening, we put our heads together and we're going out and getting a different design firm to engineer the park. So the plan currently is for the um, future park or the courts to be adjacent to the dog park and across the street from the tennis center. We're looking at installing about six courts. Um, there could be a phased approach that will have restrooms, potential lighting, and parking improvements uh, in the phased approach. The initial um, approach is going to be to get the courts installed and then once we have the courts installed we can build the amenities onto the courts um, i have a meeting with todd alexander who is our capital projects manager and meet and hunt who is the firm uh, we're going to be attempting to work with uh, tomorrow morning to address the courts and try to get in updated scope with them. Meet and Hunt, we're going, we're reaching out to them because they commissioned a similar project for Hawks Park for the city of Edgewater last year. So they come highly recommended. So we're hopeful to get this project kick-started. Uh, I've had multiple questions from people about this project and I know it seems like nothing's happening, but that's really not the case. We're trying to find the best, the best way forward still. So 
that's our pickleball courts at uh, Page Park off Glencoe. Another hot item that I've heard mentioned before and asked to speak, um, the Commissioner Hartman asked me to speak on tonight, is our community center to the west of 95. Um, last year in 2022, the City Commission adopted a parks master plan um, that was prepared by VHB Planning and Design. Uh, VHB put together a comprehensive study and plan that was quite extensive. It took a lot of time to put that together and they came back to the city and the commission um, really valued that input and we adopted that as the city's plan overall to move forward. Now with no specific timetable to implement that plan um, exists at this time, but w this is one of the items that has been uh, brought up um, s over time, or not, not over time, but um, repeatedly. Uh, bet between 2010 and 2020, our city's population grew about 24%, which is about 6,000 people overall. So depending on where you look, the city has approximately 30,000 people, give or take, um, you know, over under, you know, that range. Uh, plan, the plan calls for an additional community center to the west of I-95 in the area the master plan referred to as West Side North. Uh, the recommendation is for the park and the community center to be located north of State Road 44 in between Venetian Bay and I-95. Potential features and components of the park and community center could include walking trails, an amphitheater, two playgrounds, multi-purpose fields, courts, pickleball courts, a dog park, pavilion, etc. I have an itemized scope of what um, the preliminary pricing would be um, coming up later in the slide. Now these were figures that um, VHB put together for us last year, so pricing as everybody knows is through the roof and astronomical, so things are fluctuating right now. So, uh, Westside North is considered the top priority in the plan in order to meet the levels of service uh, standards for the residents. Uh, LOS, which is the level of service, is a quantitative look at how well the city serves its residents based off acreage of parkland per population, access and proximity to parks and recreation facilities from residential areas, and the number of facilities by type per population. So here's a the plan for potential proposed community park locations and you guys can see west side north is um, just like I stated previously to the north of 44 and the west of 95. Um, the VHB plan proposed multiple community park and uh, um, additions to the city's uh, park inventory but the one we're talking about specifically tonight is the west side north uh, component. And this is the itemized um, invoice for a potential plan from VHB. The price tag on a community center last year uh, was about 21 million. So, you know, this is not a, a cheap project. So, um, that's where we're at. Thank you. Shame. Thank you, Rob. So our next and last speaker is Shane Corbin. Uh, uh, great turnout, uh, and thanks for the warm welcome. This is my first time presenting to the community. Um, been here a little bit over three weeks, and everyone has been very accommodating and very friendly, and really appreciate that. Uh, I was asked to talk about the uh, voluntary annexation program tonight. Um, in uh, 2013, the original um, uh, interlocal service boundary agreement with the county was put into place, and that allowed the city of New Smyrna Beach to annex parcels that were not contiguous to existing city parcels. Usually, they have to be contiguous in order to annex them in, but with this agreement put in place within certain boundaries, um, they were allowed to be annexed in. Uh, this agreement was uh, updated again in May uh, 2nd of 22. So we've got a current agreement that was just signed. What you see here on this map in the green is the unincorporated areas. This was the original map of the interlocal uh, showing the 
unincorporated areas that were now eligible for this program. Uh, the way the process works is anyone who has a parcel in the unincorporated area in that in in the within the interlocal uh, service boundary agreement uh, can be annexed in in a three-step process. So first, that goes to the planning commission for a recommendation. Uh, then it goes to the city commission for two readings as an ordinance. Uh, typically, that time frame would take uh, somewhere between two to three months depending on when the meeting cycles hit, when the property owners get their application in, and things of that nature. But uh, so far what I'm being told is uh, almost any property that applies uh, will be accepted. There may be some exceptions in there depending on certain circumstances, but for the most part, uh, most people that apply do get accepted. And if your property is less than 10 acres, the city will waive the fees, trying to make it as easy as possible uh, for you and the staff will help you with a application and again trying to just streamline it make it as easy as possible So why would you want to? Uh, annex your property in and one of the main reasons is is that you would save money If you go to the county assessor's office or the website and you look at all the all the millage line items that goes to your property and you add them up it totals over 18 mils Two of those mills are for a fire district and the uh, Volusia County MSD, and those total to be 5.207 uh, mills. However, when you annex into the city, those go away. Uh, you do get some additional city millage rates, which you see at the bottom, but they're uh, 1.4401 mills less. So your millage rate goes down, at least historically, of course, that could change over time if the county was to drop their millage rates or the city was to raise theirs. But historically so far, that's what we've seen. I'll give you some examples of how that would work. So for starters, uh, this is a, a parcel of vacant land, um, just a, a fairly small lot. Its assessed value is a little over $11,000. No home on it. So uh, the property owner, if they annex in, would save just about 10 bucks, not a whole lot. But the city revenue still goes up, almost $50. Going to a, a more valuable property, uh, about $120,000, the property owner saves about $75. And the city revenue goes up almost 300. Let's look at another example, almost $150,000 property. The property owner saves about $115 a year the city gets almost 420. One more example, uh, if we look at a property that's assessed value at almost $570,000, the property owner saves almost 800 and the city generates almost $2,500 in revenue in the given year. So on the, on the sliding scale, the more valuable the property, uh, the more the property owner will save and the more that the city will generate in new revenue. So that's revenue that we can keep in the city to provide additional services, uh, put more police on the force, get more community centers, um, all the services that you want, and, uh, and actually save the residents money. And this is a current map showing uh, what we just looked at in green, all the incorporated areas. The, those are shown in purple, but what's in red are the properties that have incorporated in. And so far we've had about 2,000 total properties uh, uh, become uh, annexed in almost uh, 1,700 acres for uh, a little over um, $530 million. And why is that really good for the city? Uh, that generates uh, over $2 million in additional revenue for the city, and it saves those property owners almost uh, uh, $765,000. So again, why would you annex into the city? Uh, we try to make it as easy as possible. We waive the fees. We'll help you with your application. There's lower taxes. All of your government services will be here within uh, City Hall. Uh, you don't have to worry about any changes to uh, laws regarding your firearms or your livestock. Apparently a lot of people are concerned about that. Uh, if they annex in, 
They're going to lose some of their rights, and that's not going to happen. Your utilities won't change. Uh, the Utilities Commission does have the ability to run lines in front of your homes, and if a certain percentage of people agree that they want to join and, and actually tap on to that line, then, uh, then you have to, but that's going to happen potentially regardless of whether you're in the county or the city. So being annexed into the city has no bearing on that. Your zoning will change. Uh, your zoning will become a city zoning district, but we've created numerous zoning districts to mimic uh, the county zoning districts, such as the ag districts that allow uh, livestock. So uh, we can work with, with you on that and try to uh, ease any concerns that you have on that. And nothing will happen if the agreement ends. Uh, once you're annexed into the city, you're annexed into the city and you won't have to worry about it if the agreement expires in the future. And that's all I've got on that topic. Um, there's some information for who you can call if you have any questions, and I guess we're gonna take questions now. Okay, if you have a question, if you'd please come to the mic and ask your question, and if you had a, someone specifically, um, then we'll have that person address it. Um, Good evening. Thank you, Commissioner Hartman, for Vice Mayor Hartman, for uh, holding this. I really appreciate it. I have a question for uh, probably the new planning director, and that is that I'm a resident in Venetian Bay, and what's really distressing to me is it always seems like there's intrigue about what's going on with new development. And I notice on the city website, there's two meetings that are not listed. The uh, free, no fee discussion meetings with anybody who wants to develop something and the site plan review committee. And I think if those two meetings were listed with the agenda, then that would help a little bit for us to know what's being discussed. Because as residents, it's really tough to get information about what's going on. Different residents are going up to developers saying, what's going on here? For example, the, the work that's being done right at 44 at the entrance, that at one time someone was told, well, that's just something being done at the golf course. And then somebody said, oh, no, that's a... Um, commercial development with retail on the first floor, residential on the second and third floors. I mean, so you can see, we would just like to know what the heck is going on in our community. What's the best way for us to find out if someone has come to the city, they're talking about it, they filed a plan. I think those two things on the website would help, but um, I'm open to suggestions. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, we do have pre-application meetings that the public can join via Zoom. Uh, if you ever want any information on those, you can contact us on that. And if you have specific questions about a specific parcel or area, you're welcome to either call, email, or set up an appointment and come in, and we'll share whatever public information we have with you. Okay, is there a way for me to find out what the agenda is for? That's exactly the meeting I was talking about. In addition to site plan review, could I see the agenda of that and the site plan meeting so I don't have to keep going to Zoom and, hey, there's nothing here for me? Uh, do we actually post those? Because, yeah, public attend, but I don't know if we post what they They're are. They're not on the website. I checked today. You know, we, can we can we can check meetings. on that. I can tell you that sometimes we actually uh, get the request like a day before or two days before. That's normally when I get the invites to the meeting myself. So I'm not, I'm not even sure when, what's coming. I but, mean, th uh, that morning would be fine, and then then we could tune in. Okay, we can certainly work on that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you, Tony. Hi, 
Thank you for having this meeting. Um, I don't live in your zone, but I, you're vice mayor, and all of you represent the whole city, and I have a couple questions I think impact the entire city. Uh, first of all, one question I'd like to ask Mr. Fagley. Um, Can you speak a little closer to the mic? Okay, thank you. Thank you. My voice doesn't go very far. <laughs> um, about 20 years ago, when my wife and I built our house, um, we turned in blueprints that Mr. Fagley reviewed. And in fact, he probably doesn't remember it because both of us didn't have all gray hair back then. Um, at that time, I was required to submit a set of plans that had water retention, swales around my home, gutters, directional arrows showing the direction that the water was flowing to make certain that the water stayed on my property. Um, and I'm just kind of curious what changed because in my neighborhood, and I know it's also on the beach side around Saxon, I live over by the middle school, and there's new homes being built in my neighborhood um, on 50-foot lots that do not have gutters. They have a very small, small swale in the front yard and obviously the water is not staying on their property. You've only got seven and a half feet to the line. And because they're in a flood zone, they have been built so high, they even had to mount the air conditioning compressor on the side of the house. And I'm just kind of curious if the standards have changed or why these homes are not required to keep their water on site. That's one question. Okay, um, as, as far as single family homes infill, uh, the criteria is still the same. Uh, we still require a, a minimum, if you recall, it's an inch and a half runoff from the impervious surface that has to be retained on site prior to discharging elsewhere. It can't discharge to adjoining properties. Um, the, the, the gutters aren't um, mandated. Uh, sometimes they're required uh, just to provide direction, you know, for concentrated flow, but they're not required. And typically it's a two story because it sheds off the eaves. And like you mentioned, it's being so close to the property line, it tends to go to the adjacent property. So those properties should have, I can double check the, if you got the address that so we can talk after the meeting, they should be following all the criteria that you mentioned. Well, you know, I don't, I don't blame the developer um, because if he submitted plans and it was approved and the house got built, um, that's not his fault. Um, I think he should stop at City Hall. Because um, on some of these homes, I can't say it's all of them, one entire side of the house has no water retention, no gutters. So it goes on the neighbor's property. Um, so I, I would like to know if that's being enforced. Um, we checking afterwards before the final permit's issued to make sure the water's staying on site. It is, it's, uh, we have a couple reviewers and they are familiar um, and, and they are um, pretty much sticklers for the code. So they're, they're not gonna give any leniency and we, currently have a full-time inspector um, dedicated for engineering through the billing department that does final inspections. So they check all the grades, the runoff, that type of thing. And if there's issues in, uh, that they perceive, they don't get the CO for that particular development. Yeah. I know when, when we finished my home, you did the inspection. So you said, that's cool, John. <laughs> you did it. Um, and I'm not sure whether or not engineering does that final inspection for water retention or not, or whether it's the building inspector. They do. <coughs> we have an engineer. He actually works for the building department, but he's an engineer. He was transferred from our department to the building department who does all the finals and inter intermediate uh, inspections f okay. for stormwater. Okay. Um, can I have another question? Sure. Okay. Second question is to our new city planner, which I'm sure he won't have the answer because he's new. <laughs> um, back in 2011, Prior, and I'll give you a copy of this, um, prior city commission and mayor changed an ordinance that allowed um, previously platted subdivision to be able to build on a 50-foot lot. Lucky bought a long time ago. Um, it's 250 feet deep, but next to it, they can actually build eight houses next to my home on 50-foot lots under the current zoning. And I think that's something that needs to be addressed. I also sent a copy of this to the planning and zoning board as well as some pictures to show the impact it's having on the neighborhood of these homes being built on every possible square inch they can build on and again I don't blame the builder um, he's allowed to do it so he does it so I'd like someone in your department to take a look at this and maybe make some recommendations whether or not 
this needs to go on. These lots weren't made to be built, homes to be built on 50 foot lots. Maybe 50 years ago when it was platted, that was okay. But today the subdivisions aren't designed to hold the water or parking or traffic. So, I can know. speak generally to that uh, and then I'll do some research to follow up and get back to you. But typically once a, a platted lot exists, then it's a lot of record. And if you're the property owner, then you have property rights to build on it. Um, unless the city has uh, provisions in its zoning code to prohibit that. But then you run Previously into all kinds did. of, you run into all kinds of issues of what if you have multiple owners? What if you have eight owners for eight lots? Um, then, then, you've, then you've got a really big problem. So that would be something that we can definitely look at and uh, talk to legal about. And, well, I'll, and I'll give you the ordinance, the one they changed, because okay. it used to be that way, but they changed it. Okay, yeah, and I'll get your contact yeah. information. Thank you guys for a great job. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for having these meetings. You guys have been trying to do your good job, uh, what you're doing. Um, in response to Kyle with the moratoriums, I feel like that's just a challenger. You know, you just stall because 10 acres or more, and that's commercial. Well, if somebody comes in and puts five two-acre residential projects in, that's 10 acres elevated, covered with concrete and asphalt. It's still dumping on all of us older, mature neighborhoods. That's one. Um, so, considering on 44, Turnbull Creek is one of three of the main watersheds. You've got Home Depot, Al Aldi's, Chevy dealership, Ford dealership. Those are like tens of acres of asphalt. You got many warehouses being developed on Glencoe. You had the huge apartment complex on the west side. So I could go on the Colony Park Road, Publix and Dixie, all of that. None of that stormwater is really being responsibly conveyed to the inlet. It's backing up in all of our older neighborhoods. So I'll move on just to give you some thought there. The police chief, thank you for your service here, sir. Uh, this town was great when I was growing up. They would drive you home if you were out of control. They were very humble officers. And I'm hoping it's still that way today. You've just got a bunch of pill-popping crackheads now that's really dangerous. <laughs> as far as the railroad, I recommend you put up digital cameras with timers. And at some point, if the FEC and this Mexican-owned company is clogging our road, that timer's clicking, and it's going to be a good moneymaker for you. It's all legit. They can be tuned into Bluetooth. You guys get your act together, but you can't mess up our local uh, community with your commercial venture making money. I wish they would have a train that ran from north to south. It'd be well worth it as a senior. Um, speed bumps. I would like to know if 75% of my street signs off on speed bumps. We uh, had, it used to be the Pub 44, it's the half wall. And everybody that got to know the area knew it was a good cut through our neighborhood. Go from 44 to Jungle Road, hit Pioneer Trail, head out to Ole's. Maybe it's called Sapotnik's Corner, I don't know. But you got drunks running through the neighborhood, and we have daycares. We have little kids that still ride bicycles and do skateboards. I would like to have speed bumps uh, now that I'm a senior. For the recreational side, you're developing Glencoe more. You're going to elevate all the pickleball courts, the northwest between Venetia Bay and whoever. That's going to elevate more property. This is what's happened through New Smyrna as we, we grew, we developed. This has always been a tourist town from the 1800s. It's just changed. What I'm respectfully asking is that you really consider what are you doing with that stormwater coming off of concrete and asphalt? It leaves a lot faster. You have codes for your stormwater ponds. They have half inch, one inch to hold. 
but that stuff's shooting through. There's 20 culverts or, or drains in the Home Depot par uh, parking lot. It goes through that, through their pond, to the east side, and it comes right down. The conveyance is Turnbull Creek. For us that are in the uh, Ellison Acres, that, that's the dumping ground for all stormwater. One of three tributaries. You have Tomoka, you have Spruce Creek, and you have Turnbull Creek. We are receiving way more of that stormwater than we should, and we all had two feet of water under our, you know, in our bedrooms, and we're destroyed. I'm still camping in my house. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, real quick. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, it's really for everybody here, for the blocked railway crossings, so to the point about the uh, digital cameras, so the Federal Railway Association does monitor the trains, and they're able to see how long those trains are at the intersections. For New Smyrna, we have a couple of issues. We have a railway yard in our city owned by FEC. That's a problem. That's where they switch cars, as well as one of their main customers, just so you know. Uh, however, there is a website that I want to point everybody to. It's fra.dot.gov. There is a bl public blocked crossing incident reporter. It's online. So if you get caught at the train and you have some time on your hands, if you just look at the little box to the left of the cross arm, it has a number on it. You can go on your phone and report that. It actually does work. The FRA told me that's how basically they monitor complaints. And when it gets to a certain level, they know that they have to take action, which will help our case as city staff when we uh, engage them. So thank you. Mike Boma, uh, I live in Venetian Bay. Uh, like everybody, I want to say thank you uh, for everything you guys do. Uh, they're pretty thankless jobs, uh, and we understand that, and we thank you. Um, for the flood improvement projects, um, I think everyone is going to be uh, uh, supporting that. Uh, my only question is for the projects that are going in for these specific areas, are we looking at what those improvements or those changes are going to do to the other outlying areas. So is pushing that water and getting that water out of there just going to put it someplace else and cause another problem? Um, and I guess that's kind of trying to, are we looking at this holistically for the overall area or are we fixing problem A and creating problem B? Uh, no, we, we don't plan on diverting the runoff to some other uh, subdivision or adjacent property. We look at um, like a pre and post condition. So uh, the pre-development condition, which is uh, the current state of that subdivision, you have you have discharge points, um, whether it be you know on Burma or the ditch along uh, Page Avenue. So uh, we, we look at all these, and you have to model. So they shed a a, a certain precip you know, precipitation or rain event over that, and whatever discharges today that volume and flow cannot be increased. So you just have to capture it on site. So there won't be any impacts to anyone downstream. All right. Good. Um, so you also mentioned like a, uh, a survey of uh, the overall area, including like Venetian Bay and Coastal Woods, and looking at the impact that those neighborhoods have on the overall uh, flood uh, plan. Uh, and that's great to understand that but it's not like any of those communities are going to go away. So rather than saying, OK, well, if we took those neighborhoods away, what would happen? That's kind of irrelevant. Uh, to me, it's OK, just have to understand what those impacts are and how, how are we going to plan ahead to improve uh, that runoff uh, from those developments? Uh, because I mean, those developments aren't going to just stop being built either. So it's OK, look at. Where they where it was sure before Venetian Bay, now that Venetian Bay is there, what has it done? But what is the the plan for those overall areas? I mean, that's what needs to be looked at. Uh, is what's <laughs> how can we make improvements uh, because of these uh, these areas and developments that uh, that keep going up? I agree. I think it's going to be a learning exercise from us. Obviously, we can't retract, you know, develop property, but we can look at the results and then apply that for future development. And obviously, there's other developments that are in the works right now, you know, west of 95, so that we can apply whatever findings come out of that particular study. Okay, makes sense. Uh, one more comment uh, for the pickleball courts and stuff like that that are, I guess, going to be uh, built here soon. Uh, you'd mentioned that uh, we're going to build pickleball courts, and then we're, we're going to look at 
uh, parking and bathroom facilities and stuff like that. Um, I would encourage you to rethink that and rather than build a bunch of pickleball courts and tennis courts that have no support facilities, uh, I think the support facilities are almost the, the more important thing to build first, uh, even if, okay, if that means there's a budget that we plan to have 10 courts, then build the parking and bathrooms, et cetera, to support 10 courts. And if that means you build that and can only put in two courts, so be it. Don't build 10 courts with no parking or no bathrooms. Uh, it would be build the support facilities to what you would plan to build and then build the rest of those courts, et cetera, as funds are available. I mean, and there again, that's just a different thought process that to me makes more sense because uh, otherwise you end up uh, with like a park like JR's Park within Venetian Bay, which has these facilities, but there is no parking. There is no support facilities to use the park, which basically makes the park useless. Uh, <clears throat> that's a... So I think what Rob was getting at is, is the phase approach would be, we may put in a temporary parking lot now, pave it at some point in the future. We may not put the lighting up yet, you know, we'll do that at some point in the future. But yes, there will be parking permitted. Um, restroom facilities may be a portable facility for now until we see how, how the project goes and, and if there's enough interest or not before we actually build the permanent structure. So th this is going to be a, like a phased approach on this one. And um, that's certainly what um, they're doing down in the Edgewater area. Um, they're building the retention pond first. Um, they're going to put a shell parking lot in, build the pickleball courts, and then, you know, progress on to paved parking with curbing and stuff like that. So and that makes sense. Like yeah. I say, as long as that's being brought oh, out and, and the support facilities will be in place, not, oh, we'll get to those next. No, uh, you, can't, you can't have these parks without the support facilities. Trust me, every one of us is very keen on parking. <laughs> so No, I get that. And, uh, and yes. I, I won't beat that dead horse. Uh, I guess last uh, kind of comment. Uh, was on the pre-application meetings that they were brought up earlier. Um, made a comment that uh, a lot of times you don't even see those plans until the morning of. Uh, that sounds like a policy problem of uh, you, if you want to have your plan reviewed, it needs to be in by such and such date for a scheduled hearing on another date. Uh, that way those agendas could be put out for residents uh, to look ahead potentially reach out to you with questions and comments uh, before even your pre-application meetings? The pre-application meeting, well, well, thank you for the, the comment and question. Uh, those are typically like the very entry level uh, meeting where the applicant or potential applicant is doing due diligence to kind of figure out, well, here's what I think I want to do, but I, is it going to work or not? And many of those, uh, those conversations go nowhere. Uh, because they end up talking with staff and we say, yeah, you can't do that. So they never make it to a point to where they would be like a, a full-blown development or something of that nature. Um, and, and again, I've been here three weeks and I've already seen that happen uh, multiple times where you have someone that comes in and uh, they, find a, they find a piece of property, there's something they want to do, uh, they're talking with staff, staff explains, well, you're going to have to get a zone change and you're going to have to do stormwater and you're going to have to do tree permits. They start telling them all the things that they're going to have to do with this, uh, whatever the particular piece of property is, and the applicant goes away because they just say it's not worth their uh, time and money to do it. So it's really uh, the pre-application meetings are just entry-level conversations. Yep, no, I, I understand that 100%, uh, but if they are a public meeting, then having some kind of a timeline so that citizens uh, could hear Somebody's thinking about doing X in my neighborhood. Uh, I mean, to just like I say, to have a timeline and say, okay, submit your plans or submit your request to be in front of us by this date for a meeting on this date. I don't think that's unreasonable, even if it's uh, just a conversation uh, that goes nowhere. It would, like I say, it would just give residents an idea of what people are considering putting in their neighborhoods. That's just, that's just a comment. Okay. Uh, like, and like I say, then posting the minutes or uh, uh, the video of it uh, online uh, would also be very helpful if that's not already being done. I, I don't believe that's being done yet, but we can definitely look into that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.
Thanks, guys, and I appreciate your time this evening. I, too, am from Venetian Bay. Seems like a few of us are here, which means probably we have concerns, and hopefully you'll look at us as being a major part of the area. Um, seems like your program that's getting this 2D presentation to show what the areas would be without Venetian Bay, I think is great. My question would be, would that also have the ability to show what's going to happen? For example, behind us is Shell Point that is going to be developed. Will your program show what happens with the water now without it being developed and what will happen to my area when it's developed? Because that's a huge concern in our area. We've had, we have flooding on regular rainy days. Building Shell Point is a major, major concern. Do you have any answers to that? Yeah, the, we, we shared as much information as we have possible with the consultant. So Shell Point, um, it's in the site plan review process right now. It's, it's nearing completion. So we have shared the information with them. But sometimes at, at design stages, you don't know what they're going to develop. You don't know the impervious surface. But we have shared that information with the consultant to keep that in, in consideration, yes. Okay, so you shared the information. Will you check to see if they are going to be able to do that? I mean, if they've got the information, is great. Are they going to utilize that information to show the effect on Venetian Bay with that's developed? That's the only question. Okay, I will definitely, uh, I'll check with uh, JEA on that, see if they can share it. Okay. Thanks. Right. Have a great evening, guys. Thanks. Good, e <clears throat> Good evening. Okay. Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Bell. I, lived at four, I live at 412 Shorewood Lane in New Smyrna Beach. I have two questions and then two comments. First question is, anybody know anything about a traffic light at Corbin Park Road so we can get ourselves out of there on the weekend? That's question number one. Question number two, I looked at the flood map back there and I don't see my house or my area there with the little red dots on it and I can show you pictures of where I had to put, I had it in my screen room and I had it in my garage and I've had beach towels at my three doors to keep it from being in my house. I think we had a lot of people in Hidden Pines who did have water if it wasn't in their house, it was darn sure close. Okay, so that's my questions. That's why we brought the map, and there's a pen back there for you to mark it. So, okay. So these maps will go back to the consultant, so that if he needs to add those areas, he can add those areas. <clears throat> a lot of people have already emailed in or called in and, and done that, so we have a lot of that already on record. But, um, you know, we didn't have the west side the last time we had the flood meeting, so... Yeah. Reason we brought the maps back just to, to make sure we got everybody. Okay. That, that's fine. If you want to share your address with me, 412 um, Shorewood Lane. <laughs> okay. I actually, I'll have our, our GIS analyst created all these maps. Yes, so sir. So I, I can have that added uh, to the, the overall, to the map. Okay. Traffic light. Who speaks okay. to the traffic light? <clears throat> I hear a rumor that we're going to get it. Um, you call it hiding back there? Call it's hiding, yeah. It's hiding. As you know, that's an F dot issue. I do know that. Believe me, I have many I, studies that we did. I, I know you have. You've got a lot of data and presented a lot of Unfortunately, things. my husband didn't live to see it go in, but I'm going to keep up the fight. Right. So, so um, I think they're still doing a signal warrant analysis yeah. for that, yeah. Well, at least I've been there 23 years, so. <laughs> right, if you want to, you want to speak, you're going to have to get in line. Why not Jordan Parkway? You put in all these other traffic lights, 
We have absolutely no control over that. I know that. I we know that. But you can. No control. You, you got some pull. Okay. <clears throat> okay. My second. My comments. Go ahead. Excuse me. My comments are with your community service people. We had the opportunity to deal with one of them last week because my daughter has moved home and getting her car registered here, and he was fantastic. Very nice, very good. We enjoyed working with him. He took care of it in just a few minutes. And Nancy in your office is fabulous. We've worked with her on the traffic signals mm -hmm. and accidents and all that. My last comment is you don't have to pave the parking lot. I'm an old Florida cracker. I went to many a ball game with myself and my kids on dirt parking lots. So please reconsider. You'll save some money, but you don't need to pay. It'll drain. It'll seep through. Go down to the aquifer. So do not pave the parking lot of the pickleball courts. If the people want to go and don't want to go because it didn't pave, tell them to go up to Holly Hill. <laughs> Thank y'all. Thank y'all for your time. Thanks. Good evening, Claudia Vanderhorst. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for doing this. Um, it's the first level of transparency since it's been some time. It's been some time. Um, I appreciate the effort and the idea behind all of this. But in regard to transparency, it's not enough to put these things up on the board and do studies and revisit the same studies and talk about like the leisure plan that was started three years ago and not carry it through to fruition, fruition where we know where the, where the money's coming from. All of the development that's being approved and allowed here is collecting impact fees. You know my subject on impact fees. Um, there's allocations for different things within our community and how that money is being spent. He put up a slide, financial slide, of $21 million for a community center, but there's no conversation about how that might be paid for and what portion of our impact fees for all the development, commercial and residential, is going to contribute to that because that's what part of that money is supposed to be for in addition to the infrastructure, support services for our, our law enforcement, the pre-planning meetings with an agenda. That's transparency. Um, the study of what will happen with uh, that new development out by Venetian Bay. That's exactly what we're experiencing. I live in the Isles of Sugar Mill and Coastal Woods is, has pretty much changed our lifestyle. Um, that information wasn't given to us in advance. I even did a uh, request for information study through the city to find out if our community received any advance notice of what was going to happen to our stormwater system when all of the thousand acres or however many it is in coastal woods was built up, filled, and discharged. How that was going to, if we were ever notified that our stormwater system was going to be utilized, if we were granted the opportunity to speak on it, ask for permission, um, and request maintenance the long-term impact of what's going to happen to our community because of that development. So the gentleman who brought that up, it's, it rings true. And to me, that's transparency. It's transparency for the future. If we're going to do all of this and, and spend all this money on these beautiful studies and the slideshows and the booklets and the hours of time that our, you all are spending here, well, make something of it. Make a change and, and make sure that we're doing the right things long-term and not just gloss it over and say, yeah, oh yeah, we did that study. It's up on the shelf somewhere. The, to me, the core of all of this is the transparency to your taxpayers. And I appreciate the fact that you're inviting us here to let you share, to let us share with you what our priorities are. I just hope it's being listened to and it will be carried through. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Greg Belitz. I live in Venetian Bay. Thank you for having this meeting, we really appreciate it. And um, first of all, I'm going to talk mainly about Venetian Bay because I bought in there 12 years ago. I've been to many sitting meetings. I had my three minutes. I talked. I showed plans, what I was promised in Venetian Bay. And don't hear anything from the city. I gave them a copy of the original plan. The biggest problem I have, uh, Mr. Hartman, is you've been the uh, commissioner for six years in Zone 4? Okay. 
So everything that's happened in Venetian Bay for the last six years is run right in front of you, and the city's approved pretty much everything that GeoSAM has put in front of them. Okay, so first of all, when I bought there 12 years ago, I have two young children. My daughter was three. She's 14 now, and my son's 18. And we've been there 12 years. When we bought on Pagasso Avenue in Savona South, we were promised amenities. And I don't think the city goes out and looks around the state of Florida and sees what's really going on with PUDs of this size. This is the, the biggest PUD in New Smyrna Beach, it, I'm sure. It might be one of the biggest in Volusia County. It's basically four square miles. It's 2,500 acres. You got 7,000 voters and taxpayers that live there. We've been abandoned by the city. I stood up many a time with my three minutes in front of the city, said the same thing as what I'm going to tell you right now. And you guys just look at me, and you don't do anything. Everything that GeoSAM wants, the city gives them. I know they're big and powerful. I know they got a bunch of money, and they got big attorneys. For an example, look at Venetian Bay. What amenities do we have there? We have one tennis court they've been building for nine months. No lights. We live in Florida. Okay, I'm a tennis player. My son was one of the top tennis players in the state. My daughter still competes. And we moved there. My wife's a realtor for Ocean Properties, okay? We were lied to by Venetian Bay Real Estate, the Johnson Group, GeoSAM. I went, I got a picture on my phone from Martin Pham, Fame, whatever his name is, the vice president of GeoSAM. In his office, it showed a big development, a model of Venetian Bay. It showed tennis courts in JR's Park. Two lighted tennis courts in there. Never happened. There's also a, uh, a pavilion that was there, a playground. Nothing happened. We have a ghost land in JR's Park. We got a, a big field that used to be a baseball field, this wasteland, it's nothing. We got an old basketball court. That's what the city, does the city really care about 7,000 homeowners that live in there? We pay big money to live in there. We pay a lot of taxes. They don't care. You were right there the whole time. The rest of the city, when Jerry started that property 20 years ago, they're looking at it. Why doesn't somebody go to Venetian Bay? No one even went there to look around. When I first started talking about it, I went to every board meeting for the last 12 years at the middle school. We can't have our own board meeting. You know why? There's no place to have it. We got to go. Right now we can't have one because they can't schedule one because of the middle school. So we have, GOCM tried to sell us a little baby um, uh, office space. They, tried, they, they sold it to us, and then they told us that was our community center. I don't understand how the city can let them. I know they got a bunch of money, and they got a lot of power, but why do you guys let them do what they're doing? It's crazy. So, so I live on Pagasa. We were going to walk to tennis. We have nothing there. The kids have nothing to do there. There's it's nothing there. There's no parking. There was a bad development, you know, in, in the get-go. You guys should have looked at that project and said, hey, what are these people going to have? If you guys, if you looked at other projects, go to Bartram Springs in, in St. Augustine. Look at my friends just sold their house there. They lived there for 10 years. Beautiful. They got amenities. They own their amenities. We don't own anything. We own JR's Park. We own a little playground off Airport Road. And we own a one tennis court, hard court, not lit, and two pickleball courts aren't done yet. That pickleball court is 10 feet from someone's master bedroom. How can the city approve that? 10 feet from someone's bedroom. They bought 7,000 acres. I know GeoSense is powerful, and they own coastal woods, and you know they got all this money for the city. You know what I'm saying? But why would you guys, when they have a 7,000 7, thousand acre 700 acre property that they just bought you knew we had nothing we had zero we have nothing that pool is not ours that's owned by geosam that's going away in a year and a half okay and we're trying to fight we're trying to get together thank god for joe what he's done for for us but geosam is going to probably want to build apartments there okay what are they going to do you think they're going to lose money for another keep on on that pool that pool they've already I already know for a fact it's going away so we're trying to get a community center. We have nothing. So look at the property. Look at 7,000 owners. 
3,500 homes, you, you approved everything. You and the commissioners approved Palms Phase 6. Look at the Palms. You walk in the very last entrance by Savona South. Drive down that street. You got single family, you got affordable housing quadplexes. There's four people on one lot. I feel bad for those people because that you go in one driveway, there's four. You just, they just crammed them all in there. You just let them just cram all those people in there just, for, just to make sure GeoSan's happy. And, and they even told me, I go to every meeting. I got my little three minutes, and I talk to them. They don't say nothing to me. And now, like, thanks to Joe, he said, Greg, you've got to start going to city meetings. I've been to city meetings. But, you know, you got voters out there. You see what, you know, people care about our community. All I care about is Venetian Bay. So what are we going to do now? There's no property left. What are we going to do in JRS Park? Nothing. There's no parking. You know, that's the only thing we can do anything. We got this one tennis court, no lights. Like I said, they should be lighted. They should be away. We have 30 pocket parks all over that whole community. 30 of them. Pocket park is a little locked. It's worthless. Why can't the city negotiate? There are certain people that are negotiators. They should have negotiated. Look at that big giant PUD plan that was approved by the city, the MDA, and said, this is ridiculous. You got pocket, in Savona South, there's a pocket park in the very back of our community. The people on both sides are loving it because there's no house. It's a double lot. Nothing. You got, you got another one in Savona South. You got a couple in Arbor Lakes. You got them all over the community. Why didn't you guys say, okay, Geo Sam, build homes on those lots? But you need to build a grand facility for these people. Because this is the worst PUD in the state of Florida, this size. And if you need proof, I can get it for you. They, all other PUDs this size has amenities. You're supposed to fight for us. You know, and, and nobody did. So now what we have is um, we have, we, we're trying to fight for a community center. You know, we don't know what's, we, we want to maybe put it, we want it, we don't want to go on 44. Okay, we have a big community that runs from from 44 to Airport Road, I mean to uh, Pioneer Trail on Airport Road. And we don't want to leave. We don't want to go out there with all the crazies on 44. There's wrecks every day. You got all the spring breakers, all the tourists. We, we have a community that's big enough. When, you, when the city looked at a 25 acre project like that, they didn't say, wait a minute, what are these people going to do? What are they going to do? We have nothing to do. We can get in our cars and drive on B side to go play pickleball, you know, we still don't have pickleball courts. Florida, and I can't believe you guys, everyone's saying, you know, people are saying, well, when Geo Sam's late, leave, we can do something. We don't have any property. They sold everything. There's a million dollar piece of property right there at Airport Road and Pioneer Trail. Million dollars, commercial property. Okay, they're going to sell that, and there's no telling what they're going to do. We could all buy it. It's $300 a homeowner. But you try to get everybody to approve of that. There's that property that's going to be gone. They're going to, be, they're going to build something there or whatever they're going to build. You know, there's, there's nothing left. The pool's going to be gone. What are they going to build? They're going to build more apartments or they're going to build more condos, you know? And then there's no, there's no property. There's nothing. In the Palms Phase 6 never should have been approved like that. You guys should have said, wait a minute. Think about it. Look at the pocket parks. Get all those stupid pocket parks. We'll, we'll make a deal. We'll negotiate. We'll give you all them pocket parks. You can build all these 30 houses and you're going to give us a big chunk of land that you could build 30 houses on in the back of the woods. I'm talking about on state, you know how the, the phase six goes way out to 44? You know, they haven't started it yet. They're still building phase five all over the place. You can't even go down that street to go to, the, to look at the pickleball courts that aren't even there yet. It's, it's crazy, all the people parked out there and the construction people. But you guys should have said something. I don't understand how the city managers and the commissioners can't look at that and say, hang on. Now, they're going back to Canada. They don't even have an office in Venetian Bay anymore. You know, they're, they're on the way out. I mean, they made their bucks, they got their, they got their money, and they're gone, and we're sitting here with nothing. We don't own anything. You know, most PUDs are handed over to the H HOA by the developer, and I've lived in many in the past, and you own those things. We don't own anything. You know, what are you, you going to do in JRS Park? You got people that live there at JRS Park, you know, close to it. They don't want anything in there. What can we do now anyway? There's no parking. I could walk there. If you guys put two lighted tennis courts in the way back there so we could play tennis or whatever, I could walk there, but other people can't. There's no parking. There's nothing left. I just feel like that the city really let us down, and you can tell them. I've told everybody I talked to, and I talked to a lot of people, that the city let us down, and it's wrong.
what, what happened in Venetian Bay. Now we're sitting there scrambling. You're going, oh, we're going to build something out on 44. Okay, we're going to go drive. I got a golf cart. My daughter's 14. I think she can legally drive it now. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we like to go places. I got a dog. We like to walk. We don't want to get out of Venetian Bay. We got a community that's giant. You know, what are we going to do now? What can we possibly do now? There's no property. At the front entrance, they're going to build something maybe one day with uh, Chantal and Jerry, you know, which is fine. But, you know, there's no property. Just show me whether there's property across the street of the, of the town center that's uh, um, going to build two apartment complexes, I guess, one or two more, whatever it is. You know, they were going to build a public. They were gonna, I know the school's never going to happen. But, you know, it's just not right. And I want, every, I want you guys to understand I appreciate it, but um, there's nothing we can do now. What can we do about GeoSAM? Because GeoSAM told me, because I stand right up like I do here, right in front of all of them, and I tell them how I feel. They say we're out here to make money, and that's it. Like I said, I told Martin, the vice president of GeoSAM, at a meeting, I said, listen, if, it used to say tennis courts coming soon. This was 12 years ago. So what's happened in 12 years? The city doesn't look at anything. You know, and, he, and, he, and a week later, it was off their website. He had a model in his office, like I said before, in his office that showed our community with amenities, okay? I went there two weeks later after I pulled Martin out of his office and said, Martin, look at this. There's tennis courts, dude, right there on, in JR's park. There they are. I got a picture on my phone I could send you of them. The, two weeks later, they were scratched off. The tennis courts were gone. So it's just wrong. You know, nothing we can do now. Okay, and, and for, for the uh, police chief, um, first of all, in Venetian Bay, it's dark, okay? This is, GeoSAM, I don't know if they, I know Amber's not here, their attorney, and I know they, own, they run the board. There's five of them on our board, and there's only two of us, so we have no power. But there's a plan of streetlights in Venetian Bay. I saw it from the city. On Fagasso, there's supposed to be one, like, staggered. They never came in and put the streetlights in. Go out there at nighttime and look and see how dark Savona South is. I got kids, you know. It's dark. That's the biggest problem because GeoSAM does not want to spend any money. They don't want to put the street. The city told me when I first moved in there, the guy came out and showed me the plat, and he said, these, th these light posts are down there at the city on their, on their facility, and they're already built, and the, but nobody wanted to put them in. I think that would help because where there is crime there. People got broken into just the other night. But I think that with the police department or the city, because we can't do anything. I mean, all I can do is say it's dark, you know. And also that light going across on Luna Bella at 44, that little blinking light, is that as bright as the ones on beach side? Because the beach side, when you drive down beach side and some tourist walks out there, those lights flash and people stop, hopefully. We do because we know about them. But I don't, I don't think those are very bright, those, uh, those crosswalks. You know, I, I wanted to say that. And also for the gentleman about the amenities that they're going to build over there, maybe possibly the tennis courts, are they going to be clay courts? Are they going to be lighted? Do you know? You're referring to the pickleball yes. courts? Yeah, the, the pickleball and any, okay, pickleball courts in Florida, they need to be lighted. I know GeoSAM doesn't get that. Sure. But. So I've talked extensively with the Pickleball Club, and that was the Pickleball Club's number one request is the lighted uh, component to the courts. Okay. Uh, as we said, uh, that may come in a later phase, depending on, you know, budgetary, you know, what, what we can get in in the initial phase. So we're, we're working on that. Okay, but that's just definitely pickleball. on the radar. But isn't there going to be maybe possibly tennis courts, too, over there across from the tennis center or something? Or is that just pickleball? That's strict. We're strictly building pickleball currently. Okay. Um, I would just refer pickleball. you to the tennis center if you wanted tennis courts at yeah. right now. Okay. Well, that, that, that's important. But, you know, what can we do now? And I just want to ask Mr. Hartman, what can we do now about the pond? Because along, we keep on waiting. I took a, photo, a time stamp picture the other day and put it on the Facebook page, and everybody talks. I got like 50 likes, okay, about the tennis court still not built. How can we... How can we get them to build us another tennis court with lights somewhere on that huge properties? What do we do? I know the MDA says they don't have to do anything, basically. But, you know, the pocket parks. Right, and we can you only know. enforce the MDA. I okay, can tell you, you guys can't negotiate I can anything? I mean, as I a city. I can tell you that there's been more conversations, more meeting, more staff time in the last three months regarding Venetian Bay. Because of Joe. Geo Sam. Where'd he go? Because it, of Joe uh, Dumblack. That's why, the, the, because the of the homeowners coalition that I'm on. Years before, 
okay, and my job is I'm on the team, I'm the team leader for the parks and amenities. There is no parks and amenities, because we have no power. But if there is no legal requirement for them to put it in, we can't <laughs> force them to put it in. Okay. So, so that, yeah, are you guys proud of Venetian Bay? Are you guys proud of the amenities in Venetian Bay? Are you guys proud of what we have in Venetian Bay at Throne Water? What if you live there? No. Okay. So, no. So no. Well, no. then why didn't you negotiate with them? You're sitting there signing off on everything. Yes. What do you need? Apartments? Yeah. What do you need? More more? You know, why didn't you guys negotiate? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I don't think I'll be as impassioned as this gentleman, but thank you. Um, my name is Linda Cody, and I live on Torrey Boulevard in um, Venetian Bay, but that's not what I'm going to be talking about. I am a 20-year-plus volunteer at the History Museum, and we live in a town that's the third oldest town in the state of Florida. And I didn't see anything printed indicating that there were people with historic background about what this town means to the state of Florida and to the United States. We are the third oldest city in the state of Florida. We have wonderful carved out areas all through the town that I'm sure are gonna be impacted by a lot of the people that are gonna be building in here. And we need a historic umbrella over what is being done in this city. I also volunteer at Canaveral and I know what it means to have the imprint of a place that will not change and we have a wonderful city here and we are standing on 250 years of history and we probably far exceed any other city other than St. Augustine and I would love to see all of us be very impassioned about making sure that our history for New Smyrna would stay alive with all the things that you'll be doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for holding this meeting. My name is Hans Hubeck. I nearly got killed the other day crossing on Luna Bella. Luna Bella has become a speedway in spite of a traffic study that was supposedly done years ago. The young lady, I was in the middle of the crosswalk right next to my house and she was on the phone, didn't even try to break and zoofed right by me. I was, I looked and luckily I noticed she didn't pay any attention. First of all, how long does it take for the city to put in a crosswalk warning sign right when you come on the first intersection of La Conda and Luna Bella because the road is curved. They don't look. Please put a cross sign there because they're speeding like crazy besides the noise. That's another issue. Yeah, but Luna Bella needs something. And I thank the chief for explaining that traffic slowing system, yeah, that only 75% of the people on Unabella have to agree, not the whole community. But in Promenade Park, there's one other big problem. That's a section of Venetian Bay that's on its own, the crosswalks. The previous mayor, yeah, did make sure that the crosswalks right at my intersection there of La Conda and Lunabella was done. I send them pictures of many more. He promised they would all be looking at the others. That unfortunately never happened. There's another one where their one crosswalk was never even installed on Leonardo and Luna Bella. There is West Laconda and Caterina, the tower, the traffic circle in Promenade Park. There's hardly anybody can see any striping any left. Can that please be addressed? Because very soon, we will have a fatality on Luna Bella. Thank you. Can you email me these uh, addresses? Oh, I can do that, Josh, sure. Thank you. Hello. Hi. 
My name's David Will. I live on Promenade Park at Venetian Bay. We're the section that is off of Pioneer on the east side. And uh, my, um, my request is to the city engineer that this study of the flooding study that's happening, I guess we're towards the end of it, getting towards the end of it. I'm really worried about that shell point development that's gonna be put in. Because if you look at, uh, I send in pictures, if you look at the Hurricane Ian impact, all that whole area came over into our area. It looked like a lake coming over into Fominate Park. All of our homes looked like lifeboats in a, in a bay. Uh, we had some houses get flooding, but almost all of us had water in our yards, and, and uh, it was very bad. There's, um, Promenade has a series of lakes in it, and they all feed into one another, and then they go into that canal. Are you familiar with that canal that's right on the uh, south side of us? It's, uh, I think the Army Corps of Engineers put that in. That canal goes all the way east, and it's gonna be a support system, I'm sure, for Shell Point too. That whole canal over flooded its banks. And so if Shell Point goes in and puts all their lakes into a, that same canal, it's gonna be exceeded. Is that something that's gonna be studied um, um, as part of that, um, that flooding study? Or will we make sure that we don't create a disaster when they put in Shell Point and what's gonna happen with that canal? Sure, as, as I mentioned, uh, I can bring it to the consultant's attention with regard to the, uh, you know, the risk analysis, but <coughs> there's a, a couple items. First, the, the design for Shell Point has to follow our current guidelines, right? And they have to get a water management district permit. So they have to model uh, internally uh, the pre and post uh, peak attenuation rates and flows. So they have to prove to us that no additional water goes into that canal system than there was in the existing condition than, than actually goes in there today. So if, if, if they discharge you know, one gallon of water per minute into that canal, they cannot exceed that rate when they put in asphalt roadways, when they put in sidewalks, when they put in all the homes. So they, they have to actually prove that and, they've, and they've, they've done that. They've provided the calculations to show that they do not have any, any adversarial impact to degrade the capacity of that canal system. So that's part of their requirement. Is it part of the requirement that they won't add any more water in that canal that's in that canal today? No, it's, it's part of the requirement. They, they look at the, the overall, the entire uh, development, right? You have to look at uh, any existing ditches, canals, any water bodies, any low areas uh, that currently hold water, those are modeled, right? Um, those are considered like nodes. They, they have a certain capacity. So we figure out what all that capacity there is today, and then when then they run that nine and a half inch rain event over that, and that discharges into the canal. So whatever discharges in the canal cannot be exceeded when they put in all the new development. So yes, it's, and they have provided that information to us. I have no idea how, once they put the houses in there and the lakes in there, how there's not gonna be more water in that canal that's going in there today. I can't imagine how they could do that. They have, they have on-site stormwater management systems. So they have to develop their own ponds, their wet detention ponds, basically. They have to develop all that, and then they have those, same as what you have, you have the control structures. So right. you'll, you'll see these concrete structures in the pond, right. and those are set at that certain elevation to pop off once exactly. it exceeds that. I understand that, but what happened in that storm was all the lakes got all full. They overflowed the overflow in the last canal, and then went all the way across Leonardo Street. Okay, so there's a continuous lake from like there's now on Leonardo all the way into that ditch. That was a whole lake. Oh, I understand. That was 21 inches of rain. And it's also so, going, to, it's going to be worse when they put yeah. in shell points, my point. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Vice Mayor, Joe Blavac from Venetian Bay. Um, first comment is with respect to the park study. Uh, the entire study had a cost estimate of $121 million, 21 of which was for uh, the park west north. 
the big question is, which is, oh, by the way, a zoning, a zone park, zone four park. Uh, the question is, uh, an open question really, is does the city, does the city commission have the resolve and the city itself have the resources to in fact fund such a facility? Uh, the second point though with respect to the park is that happens to be a zone four park and it in no way diminishes the need for facilities at Venetian Bay, both in terms of the community center and park facilities. The second point I have is that, <coughs> excuse me, um, one of the elements during the uh, storm was that the entire town center in Venetian Bay was flooded. Nothing in the homes, you won't see that listed, the entire town center was flooded. We have an activity going in there called Village Center East, which is gonna reduce even more the amount of drainage that's available. Uh, the open question again is, should Village Center East have included a retention pond? Uh, on a separate element regarding flooding, even during a normal rainstorm, there are elements within Venetian Bay that flood regularly and have standing water up to three or four feet. Uh, conservation areas that were there when we bought all of a sudden turn out to be devastated because the trees have died and the winds from the hurricane have blown them all down. And it, it links in with Village Center East because adjacent to that facility is a big conservation area. Everybody likes that, but if less we address it more aggressively, we're gonna have runoff in three feet of water in there and lose all of our facilities. Um, let's see. Last question is, uh, can we get a status of the borrow pit on 44? Uh, we were, when it was proposed or so, there was gonna be a big impact on traffic, and I was just curious whether in fact uh, it has been idle all of this time and didn't know whether uh, we know whether they're gonna start operating there or not. Um, lastly, a quick, and I apologize, public service announcement. For those of you who live in Venetian Bay are unhappy with what's going on with the developer, are unhappy with what's happening with the uh, HOA there. There is an element that has been formed called the Homeowners Coalition, and we invite you to join us. Thank you. I, I can address Joe's question regarding the borrow pit. At this point, they're still required to get uh, traffic signal permits from DOT. Uh, the last we heard from DOT, they are working with DOT to get those traffic uh, intersection permits for the lighting. So they can't move forward until they get that and that's still in the process. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Nick Rella. I live in, um, <coughs> excuse me, Portofino Gardens. is part of Venetian Bay. Um, we got it, we got our streets got hit pretty badly with the, with the storm. We had 20, to 20 to 30 inches in the street for four or five days afterward. Houses got flooded, and a lot of them were within a couple of millimeters of getting flooded, my own included. My question is, we're surrounded by wetlands, Venetian Bay, Portofino Gardens, in fact, all along 44. Is there gonna be, a, if the, the study that's going on, is that gonna take into the, uh, you know, it kind of account for the impact to the wetlands on well, with the stormwater issues? I mean, they're an important part of stormwater, you know, uh, uh, well, the absorption of rainwater and all of that. Is, is that gonna be looked at? We, we aren't gonna look at, high, at wetlands per se. It's not a biological approach. It's more of a hydrology, uh, exactly. hydraulics exactly. approach, H&H &H approach. Exactly, that's flooding. the problem. Um, I believe the problem that, or part of the problem with us is we have a stormwater detention system, not a retention. And we're, all of our streets, they capture the water, send it to the ponds around the golf course, and finally they send it out to the Sam Sula Creek uh, Canal. 
the wetlands are supposed to be part of that dispersion. There's supposedly um, swales that go into them to, uh, in case the lakes overflow, but that never happened. I think it came back from the wetlands because they're continuously at a high level. There's, there's no more, there's no movement out of there. Is that going to be, you know, I think it should be looked at as part of this whole deal because it's going to happen again. It's happened before and it's going to happen again. Well, they're, they're just going to consider the entire subdivision as a whole. Right. So um, I, I'm not familiar. A lot of times the stormwater management system has to rehydrate wetlands because uh, they're, you know, dissected. Uh, they're, right. they're cut off. So it's part of the design. But it's not going to get into that detail. It's going to look at the overall right. development. We have, we have almost eight or nine months of weeping from the wetlands underneath or down the swales between the houses or in the ground. They come out on the street and you can actually see it almost. And this hasn't been, you know, it hasn't rained in three or four weeks at times. And yet you still have water coming out from the bottoms of the driveway into the street. So, I mean, it, it's there, it is an issue. And I really think it should be looked at, to be honest. Okay. No, I'd be glad to talk to you about it after the meeting if you'd like. And would you would you also if we're also trying to um, come up with some ideas with that stormwater de uh, detention system to maybe prepare for another hurricane that would come through? Would you guys be able to sit down with us and, and talk about that at some time if we got in contact with you? Yeah, sure. We, we've done that with other communities. Um, you know, preparation means like. Uh, you know, pump down in advance, pre-pump, that type thinking. of thing, That's just so you include uh, the capacity of the system is exactly. at 100% yep. prior to that. So, but that's going to more likely require a modification to your district permit. Right. That's, but yeah, we I can, that. yeah, be more than happy to sit down with you at, in, in my office and go over your plan, and mm -hmm. we can endorse anything that uh, anything that abates flooding will endorse. Mm -hmm. And it would be up to the Venetian Bay Homeowners Association to modify the permit. Then I'm assuming. That is correct. It's a private system, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Evening, guys. Hey. Uh, my name is Rob Steele, a uh, potential future business owner in Venetian Bay, so kind of a theme in the Venetian Bay area, right? So we kind of inherited a lot of this craziness outside of the flooding and all that stuff, but uh, I almost feel like there's a, like a, a parking Ponzi scheme kind of going on here. So as we're trying to build uh, our business in there, parking spots seem to be disappearing, especially across the street. And even the, the part that we thought were allocated towards retail and commercial establishments, come to find out that's all privately owned. It could be sold off or gated at any time, so outside of our control. So uh, without the, the actual numbers of how many units are in the bottom there, I don't know if there's a particular amount of parking spots that should be allocated to retail and or commercial units. And if those go away, are those still considered retail commercial units at that point? Yeah, uh, without taking a close look at the PUD and uh, the development agreement, I can't answer that on the spot, but okay. certainly can look at it. I appreciate it. Thank you. I know that Ron looked at it once before, or somebody did, and they had the adequate number of parking spots then, um, so they would have to maintain them. There are a requirement for those, so. Yeah, those are going away because I believe they just sold the property across the street, which right. I think they temporarily... Uh, Band-aided those parking spot allocations, and then now, if that goes away, from what I saw, I think there's like a, a spot and a half per unit they plan to put across the street, which doesn't. There's no uh, accountability for all the, like, uh, all the parking needs right now. So I think that's the the tricky part. We're trying to figure out where's everybody going to go once that's there, and then if they decide to sell the parking across the street where everybody else parks now, then where does where does everybody go? Yeah. It, and again. <coughs> Hours and hours and hours of uh, lots of staff have been looking at this for the last three or four months. So. I appreciate it. Oh. Any pictures or aerial photography you need, let me know. <coughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. Sure, you can reach out to me, and then we'll get them to the appropriate agency or the appropriate staff. Okay. Okay. R. Hartman at cityofnsb.com. 
All right, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, it's certainly been enlightening and, <laughs> and compassionate. Yes. Yeah, so, but, uh, you know, this was our goal when we had the strategic plan was to have more of these community meetings, um, have some one-on-ones with you guys, smaller groups, um, so that you're not, some people are intimidated by City Hall and the whole governmental process. So we certainly thank you for all coming out tonight and uh, certainly enjoy the time spent. So have a safe drive home.